good afternoon and good evening, everyone. Gerard here. Uh, today we have another wonderful speaker and presenter for our Foresight series run by the Alpha Group. For those of you that are not quite familiar with the Alpha Group, let me give you a two minute overview. The Alpha Group have been established for about nine years. We are currently now in over 30 countries worldwide. And the Alpha Group is a peer to peer executive board. It works exclusively with business owners. So only the owners of businesses, what we call SME, small to medium enterprises. These business owners become a member of the Alpha Group and we physically meet, not online, not on Zoom, we physically meet around a boardroom table once every calendar month from about seven in the morning till 2 p.m. And we engage with workshops, masterminds, and so on. Every alpha group is run by one of our worldwide regional directors. The aim of the alpha group, very, very simple. In fact, we make one promise and one promise only. And that promise is that we will double the value of their business within two to three years. And so far, ladies and gentlemen, we have never failed. The Alpha Group is very exclusive. In fact, actually, if I could find a way of expressing how exclusive it is, in any city, no matter how big, let's take Istanbul, let's take Rome, Athens, with millions of people, we only allow 20 members to be a member of any one alpha group, only 20. But more than that, we never allow two people in the same industry. So only one hotel owner, one engineering company, one restaurant, one architect, and so on. So very, very exclusive. We work together as a cohesive team, helping those women and men to build, grow, expand, and develop their businesses. So that's a little overview of the Alpha Group. Uh, the Alpha Group launched the Foresight series a, a year or two ago during the COVID situation. And every month we invite very special speakers to come and talk on a unique topic. And today we have a very special lady, a lady that actually I know rather well. We have known each other going back, oh, I don't know, 15, 18 years maybe maybe 20 even. Mm -hmm. And Judy is not only a magnificent coach, trainer, mentor, presenter, author. She's an author of some incredible best-selling books to do with health, nutrition, diet, and well-being. And today she's going to give us a, a talk on a subject that actually is, 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 is so important. It's about being a good-hearted leader and creating positive change within organizations. So Judy, welcome, lovely to see you, and over to you. Thank you, Gerard. It's very nice to be here with you. Um, and it's very nice to meet all you new people as well. Um, and this is a very nice number, actually, because I know that it's going. this is going to reach out to more people. But today, um, you know, I'm quite happy for you to be asking questions in the chat and for you to kind of, and we can dive in in directions that I haven't necessarily planned to go in. And I'll be quite happy with that. Um, so what I, I promised you a few things and I'll, I'll um, you know, in the, the, the blurb that you were sent. So we'll do that. But just by way of an introduction, um, first of all, I'd just be interested to, if you want to, just to get in the habit of putting in the chat, just be interested to know if you haven't said already where you are and just in a word or two, something about the nature of your business so that we can see what, what we're up to here in this group. So just in two or three words, what, what you're up to. So I would say coach, mentor, workshop leader, author. ADHD coach, how wonderful. 
Oh, you're you're speaking. You're listening to somebody with ADHD here, here today, Salia. So maybe we have conversations to have. And finance industry now learning coaching. How lovely, Federico. So you've got plenty of real life experience, and now you're you're waiting doing which, something which is quite good to do as you get older to pass some of it on, but in a way that's not pushing. Lovely. Automotive executive. Well, that's another something different. Trisha in London, a coach and a mentor, um, a trainer, lecturer and team coach. So we, we're quite warm on coachy type people here, which is great. <laughs> and because all these coachy people do other thing, interesting things as well. Um, so I wanted to start off just something personal. And that in the last few days, this is what I've been up to. I had a cold get that got to the point oh I can't do it I can't do it you know I'm running out of tissues I've got through that um I've um had my my laptop broke so I had to do all my late notes longhand I had to get a friend to let me lend me an um a, a laptop so I'm working on a pc rather than an apple so I've had to work with lowering anxiety about all of this um and um and so I've done all my prep longhand now, that's not there as a sob story. That's not why I'm telling you that. I'm just saying that we've all got stuff going on all the time. So I think any of you could have written a, like a list like that about what you've been up to, whether it's to do with, you know, what's happening in your life stage, what's happening in your circumstances with your family and your friends, who you're caring for, um, what's motivating you, what's upsetting you, health differences, personalities, dependence, interest, needs, um, all of these things um, are impacting you and how you come into the day. And so are, and if you have staff, so, so and that's true for all your staff. And this internal stuff, although it's very individual and none of us would have exactly the same named issues, it would look rather different probably if we wrote it in, in shorthand, um, but this human stuff is what's going on all the time and it, we we know it, we sense it, we're aware of it, but we don't know the details of it. I've just, um, okay, so I've got Gabriella's coming to join us. Um, but that's that's kind of our common ground is that we've got stuff going on. And if there's too much stuff going on, um, it is impeding and it's going to be in the way of what you're up to in your business. And we are also dealing with that with your clients and your customers and what stuff is going on with that. I mean, has there anybody here ever been grumpy with somebody that they were expecting an object or a service from? And actually it was partly to do with the bad mood that they were on. So anybody put their hand up, uh, can see a couple of grins there. Um, but you know, our own moods are playing into things. Oh, Frederica says never. Oh, good. We've got, well, you can tell us how to do that, how to totally manage our emotions all the time. Um, so that that's, in a sense, this is where the, um, the slow coach approach comes in, which is um, the book that I'll be talking about um, today. And for those of you who are live on the call, um, next week, I'll be able to you know, if, if you're in touch with me next week when I've got a laptop again, I'll be very happy to to give you a um, a copy of the e version. Um, so you know, don't worry too much about writing the details down. You, you'll be hearing about that. But this book came from um, thinking about what what do you actually do when you're coaching, when you're working with people, and the people I work with who kind of got me going on this. Um, and one particular client was very helpful because we were able to articulate from what we were doing. So each of the different co slow coach approaches um, somehow come from real life situations. And then I peppered it with stories because um, that's how we learn. You know, that, think about little children. They're fully human. And, and the first thing they want to hear from us are stories. So I find that's a very natural way of working and that the stories that happen to pop up um, can often be the right sharing for some other person. If I share, well, in my life, this, that and the other happened, sometimes it's helpful for the other person. So it contains stories, but it's a way of mapping it out. And I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that further on. Um, 
But within it, there I came up with nine. I mean, probably if I'd had twice as long, I might have come up with four. But nine is kind of enough, enough to get your head around. And I'll give you them just as names of areas. And these are not things that you don't know. They're things that you know well because you live them and because it's part of your work. But the point is that there are things that if we hone them up, if we get better at them, we can create positive change in such a way that some of the issues that were happening no longer happen. And they're useful for people who have no intention whatsoever of ever being a coach themselves. But it's a way of them to take this on ways to interact with people in real conversations. And although it's called the slow coach approach, it, a lot of the time you may be in a hurry, um, but the part of the slow coach approach is very much knowing when you can allow time and when you need to allow time and when you could be doing things more quickly and efficiently if you plan things right so that you allow overall you have time and more time than you need even for relating to people and good relationships. So it starts, anybody guess what the first one would be? listening it's got to be listening and I call it heartfelt listening and it's the, at the core of what good-hearted leaders do because if you don't do the listening you don't know what's going on and if you don't create the conversation in which somebody feels safe enough and free enough and respected enough to share you still don't know what's going on even if you think you do or had a preconception that you did. So heartfelt listening is the first one. Um, and then I call, talk about powerful communication. And that's not pump, pump, push, push kind of power. It's powerful as in you being in control of the way that the meetings are, you arriving in a relaxed way, you being there for the people, you being in charge of when you need to speak very quickly because you've got to do these 10 points and you've only got two minutes. And when you can actually slow down and let people take in, the first one was listening, the second one, powerful communication. Um, so the third one is intentional well-being. And that's, you know, I'm not, I mean, Ger as Gerard knows, I do get into nutrition and things like that, but that's well-being in, in a different sense. Uh, it's in, in the emotional well-being. And it's ways to look after yourself so that you're fully present and there for the people um, that you are with in that meeting, that group, that quick phone call, that you're really there for them. And that your own well-being is such that you're not spelling, spilling your own issues out there into the space. Um, and from leaders we've had in the past, we know that there's always improvement to be made in leadership. Um, so those are the first three. And then the second um, section. So those are reasonably slow, relaxed ones. And playing with a bit of a, a music analogy here, I would say those are the adagio, the kind of more slow and relaxed. But then you get onto the next little group and they're a little bit faster. So I've called them allegro because it's, it's more active. And that's asking good questions. And I've, had, I've written an earlier book about just that, and Gerard um, was one of the contributors to that. Um, but the questions you ask and when you don't ask too many questions is incredibly important because that's like, that's the way you shape conversations. That's the way you create possibilities for the people in the conversation with you. And often the question that you ask is going to open up a space for them to have fresh thinking. And the other one in this middle section is authentic purpose. And purpose isn't static, it isn't fixed, it's changing, but to be aware of purpose and to be being purposeful in the way you do things like an attitude as well as a destination. And then there's creating harmony. And if you've got an enterprise with a few different people in it, or you've got clients who work with in enterprises with a few different people, you know that it isn't comfortable and harmonious all the time. There's discord, there's disharmony. So it's it's facing that, looking at that, and maybe upskilling and up up um, upping your game about how to deal with that. 
because every discord that you get out of the way, the better the whole piece of music is and the better the next interaction and the next interaction after that are. And then the third batch, which is slightly slower again because it's more reflective and one is seeing different perspectives because, you know, I'm the center of the universe, I'm right and I know what, no, it's not like that. I have to be aware as a leader that the people I lead may be thinking and feeling and experiencing and holding very different perspectives of life. And we all know in a society these days where there's so many divisions that we have to make space in our hearts for people who have very different perspectives on what's happening in the world. So the art of getting good at, at seeing different perspectives is important. Um, and then valuing uniqueness. And you think about all the people you work with and they're so different. I mean, they may all be the office cleaner, but each one is different. They may be somebody who's, um, you know, I don't know, your IT specialist, but it's not going to be the same as the last one you had or the next one. And they're going to have different understandings of what they think you've just told them to do. So noticing uniqueness. And, and we've got another ADH, an ADHD coach here, so we know about this. Some of us have wonderful qualities, but we don't have all of them. We don't necessarily all get all the colours in our pencil case. And it's worthwhile as a leader knowing that if I take somebody on for that job, that may be fine. If I then expect them to do that, it's not fine. And one sad little story that I'll throw in um, is um, a near neighbor of mine that I, I chat to has um, very bad dyslexia. And he was happy for a long time in a supermarket doing the trolleys. He got out young, physical, got out and did his job. Then they insisted that he had to put vegetables into the right places. So he was fine at going to get the vegetables. He knew what they looked like, but he would put cucumbers in the courgette section. He tried to explain it. They wouldn't have it. And he, in the end, lost his job. Now, that's how careful it's worth being with people because that didn't need to happen at all. That's a leader who probably, or somebody in a leadership position who missed a trick there. And then a friend of mine who was an opera singer and a very good one but got so fed up with the politics that was happening amongst everybody, you know, the relationships between the people. And if you can imagine, you know, he's busy being, he's being the lead baritone, but there's all the other dramas going on amongst people. You can imagine that in an opera company. And he got fed up with that and left. So we lost a voice because somebody didn't know how to manage things. Um, so that's about you know, valuing un uniqueness. And the other last one is about advice. And um, that's a very tricky one because we, we can love giving advice, but it's really looking at where, how that's taken, especially if you're in a power position, um, are they gonna take it as advice? Are they gonna take it on as a nicely, sweetly worded thing that they have to do? Um, and have you said the advice at the right time? And is it, advice you needed to make, because if you've had a more open conversation or if you extend the conversation, they might be in the combination, in the position of coming up with that solution or even a better one. So, but though, so that's, that's an overview of the, um, in, you know, to, of the, the, the slow coach approach. And um, looking at time, I probably ought to move on a little bit, but I do want to, um, where do we go? Um, I do want to mention that this is very interesting to be launching this work at the same time as so much is being launched um, in the world of AI. And to, to my mind, that means it's extra important that we really look after ourselves as good hearted leaders and work well with the people that, that we can help, you know, our customers, our staff, um, because we can do something that AI can't do. We've got beating human hearts. AI, no AI, AI system has that. You know, an AI system might be able to write a reasonably good Shakespeare play or something like that, 
but it won't be really because it's not being written by a living, breathing person who has fresh thinking. We're the ones with the fresh thinking. So I think this work is of, of being the best human beings we can possibly be and being good hearted leaders is probably the thing that will make or break whether AI wrecks the show or turns out to be an amazing resource so that we can get on being more human and more creative and more loving and create ways to clear up all the messes that need clearing up in one way or another in all levels of life. Um, we can't be, basically we can't be um, afford to be disempowered by AI. We've got to take on the only power that we've got that it hasn't is that we're the human beings, we're creating the systems, we're using them, and we're working with people who may really be struggling with all that. Um, so, yeah, we, we, if we, I quite like this line that I wrote, we won't fulfill our leadership roles or have staff who are fulfilling their potential if we don't bring our hearts to work with our brains. So that's kind of my introduction. And um, so the three things I promised um, were these three. And the first was moving beyond problems that use up too much of your emotional energy. And in a sense, I've already touched on that in the introduction um, by making um, the point that we have all this stuff going on. But the better we can work with it in ourselves, then it's less exhausting for us. And I was on LinkedIn the other day, just going down rabbit holes the way we do on LinkedIn. Um, somebody put up what they offered as a joke, and it was this. Finally old enough to do anything that I wanted to do. Too tired to actually do it. But I didn't find that funny at all, actually. Quite a row of people did, but I didn't find it funny. Um, because it's people with resources and imagination but they're not in harmony with their own energy and that's the basic thing that you have to align to be a good-hearted leader is that you've got the energy to do these things that you your imagination's got you into doing in the first place because if you these are your own businesses you've created it it's come out of you so where's the energy for doing that so but if you don't fix it it might lead to continuing to be in some kind of a stop start muddling muddle trying to solve, solve the problem with that person or that person um, it might be disheartening it might be frustrating including for the people around you and the other people so this can and this within a, a big group of staff this is in the way the other thing is that it might sad is it might lead you to lowering your sights i can't do this after all and what happens then? It, it might be necessary from circumstances. You know, we, we I don't know about you, but I have 50 ideas before breakfast and most of them are do doomed not to last. Um, but you want, we want some to take off. Sometimes we may have to let go, but if we want, actually we had something that got us into it in the first place, we want to follow through. It might precipitate depression because I'm not doing what I hoped I to, would do. It might lead to missing out on the potential uplift from energizing activity. So that's the cost of wasting emotional energy. So, he, and a way of checking that one out um, is to uh, ask a few questions here. Look around in your work. Are people fulfilled? Are they enjoying their work? Are they inclined to be generous? Are they leaning in with their strengths? Are they going the extra mile? Because those are the things that happy, healthy people do. So if that got you thinking in a particular direction, so-and-so, or that communication, or that team, then there's something worth looking at there because it might be an emotional energy drain of some kind. You might be using up too much of you. Um, and if you get, but if you get the energy flowing again, your business can flourish 
and it can be without draining your energy because you're in the middle of this. Everybody on this call is in the middle of something and it's a lot to manage. So that's not energy worth wasting. It's not what you want to be thinking about when you're in the shower or when you're taking the kids to school or when you're, you know, doing whatever else that you want to be free from. Do you remember when you had a job and you thought, oh, I want to be free from the job? Now you're in a business. Have you got your emotional energy sorted to the extent that when you're not doing your business, you're actually having the free time that you went into your own business for? That's the sort of thinking that it's worth in in um entertaining and that's the kind of that's where the approaches in the slow coach come in so that was the first one was moving and you move beyond the problems by going head on and solving them looking at them that's where it's sticking how do i change that communication how do i upgrade that and the second one um was about the i promised was finding your own comfortable leadership style um and the story that just, yeah, okay, I'll come to the story in a minute. But on on one, there's two parts of this. On one hand, it's quite natural to want to copy styles from other people. One of mine is my favourite English teacher from school. And my deceased parents in different ways are very helpful too, as kind of models. Um, certain people, I remember a friend saying when her child had to teach her, wasn't helping. Well, some people in life teach you how you don't want to be. But if we remember back, you know, so we can learn from those people, but we've got people in mind that we can learn from. Um, but then there's the other side of that is what are the bad habits? What are the things that we feel we should do? And a sad story, really, but um, it came out right. But a friend of mine was in a prisoner of war camp when she was a little child in Jakarta in Indonesia. And you know, in, in that situation for a few years, being guarded by Japanese guards. This was in the back of her psyche, but she hadn't thought a lot about it. But it came up to her in middle life when someone pointed out to her, and that was quite a cluey personal development person who pointed it out, that she was either looking down at people slightly or looking up and being subservient. And when she got it, she got it and she didn't go back and she realized, no, that's old. I don't want that. And she she got herself free from that. Um, but that's an extreme, but we've all had, you know, we, we all have examples of where we want to learn. Um, but it's easier to be yourself. And I wonder if you asked an actor What's it easier to do, being someone else on the set or when you go home and no one's watching except your dog? Who's the leader you want to have? The one who's as natural as, as you know, you want, if you're being led, you want to be like the dog. You want to be with this person who's being themselves. Well, that's one way of saying it. Um, so one one way to to do this and i'm suggesting it's a very important way is simply to just work with being a good leader and being well organized i like the slow coach approaches because then your focus is on the other person it's off your own ego and you're not necessarily going to be trapped in a particular style of what you have learned to think is how leaders should be you might be very charismatic you might be shy you know I was leading a group recently and somebody was apologizing for being um shy you know they were sort of embarrassed about being shy and I was saying no it's a good quality you know you just take your time to find out who you want to be in the conversation so I suppose if I was going to give advice it would be that you know work with what your own personality is and develop your own style by not bothering to develop it, but by just being, just by being a good leader, doing good conversations with people. Um, so that, I think that's probably enough on that one. Do you want to ask questions or do you want to wait until I've done the third part about um, focusing on your return 
your interpersonal return on investment. Hands up if you want. If you've got any questions already, I'm happy for you to put one or two in the chat. But if you want to wait, if you want to just want me to get the third part done. Well, no one. Sure. 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 Go carry on. Is that Federico? Is that okay? Carry on. <laughs> Thank you. Move forward. Good, good, good. Okay, right. Well, interpersonal return on the um, on investment. I'm quite proud of that because we know about in returns on investment. And if we don't, oops, we've got other different bush business issues that I'm not going to be able to help you with. But just as important is investing in the people. So it's your interpersonal return on investment. And to kind of hold things together in the book, um, I came up with an image for this, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, so you've got something to play with because interpersonal return on investment, I'm not gonna give you the right kind of spreadsheets. I'm not going to give you multiple choice tests or lists. And if you tick them in and everybody fills it in, then you're then you're hundred percent right. Um, because it's not like that with people, is it? It's really not like that with human beings. Each thing we go into, each situation in life. If I was talking, even coming into a different group this morning, I would have said different things because I'd be seeing and sensing things differently. And certainly when we're working with people in the space, it's always different. But we do know when it feels good. So for in return on investment, it's a bit like smart goals. They can be specific measurable, achievable, realistic, and time bound. So that's easily measured in numbers. But I argue that it's easy to measure interpersonal um, return on investment as well, because we're doing it all the time. We're all sensing what's going on. You know, even our pets are sensing what's going on with us. We, we're noticing each other. So it's just as measurable, but it's a different measuring scale. Um, so I had to we, and we have to invest. And what do we invest? It may, it may be money so that we've got the right staff and the right conditions. But it's, oh, hello, this one's come up. But it's also, um, I've come up with this star diagram, which um, we'll have on the screen. For, this is this is, was my trick instead of multiple choice questions, is that you take, you've got this diagram, um, and... On it, I've mapped the different aspects. So you've got heartfelt listening, powerful communication, intentional well-being, and round the circle. So I'll leave that up for you for a little while. But the point is, there's a copy of this in the book, or there'll be one, I'm not, it's not there quite yet, but there'll be one on the website that you can download. And the point is that you can just take a gold pen or an orange pen or a yellow pen. Um and um as you, every time you get a little success for yourself, you you just um, quietly colour them in. And so you get it looking like that after a little while. And after a time, you could do that. And then you could start again and carry on. And that's the only measure that I came up with. And I thought, you know, for those of you who like... Um, so I think we can take probably take that image down now. Thank you, Nia. Yeah, thank you. So um, I've got another message here. I'll get, just check my message. See if it's a question. Sorry, I'm using. Oh, great. Yes. No, we'll, we'll talk about that one in a minute. Um, so that's that's a way that you can um, keep track and actually have a sense of accumulating um, you, a return on your interpersonal investments with people, which is your time and your energy and your thoughtfulness and your rocking up being your best, ready with a story or a joke or a friendly smile with everyone that you work with. Um, and so, and if you, so buy up in your game, my contention is that you give people more space to develop an increased sense of security because they've got their with they're being led by someone nice and freedom to re reveal themselves 
because who who do people who do we want to work with who have we liked working with it's the people who are good to us the people who've given us time and space so that's kind of the um that's the overall thing of those three um and peter's just come in um what you said reminds me of nancy klein's ideas on listening and how the quality of our listening can determine the quality of the speaker's thinking yes yes and i give that in more detail which some of it will be familiar to the coachy ones but you know everybody says it in a slightly way so different way so i hope it's helpful um and it is like am i going to listen to you like this and, you know, I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, what were you saying? No, if it doesn't work, doesn't work. I've actually got, and it's harder to do this on Zoom. You would know exactly what I meant if we were in the room. But I've got to have my focus. I've got to be relaxed in my body posture. I want to slow my breathing down. And I might want to be giving them clues that I'm listening. Like, ah, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then obviously when um, questions come into that, oh, is there anything else about that? Or uh, what kind of situation is that? Um, but these cues for listening, the quality of listening, the quality of listening determines the quality of speakers thinking. Also, it serves as a counterpoint to recent emphasis on coaching in gamma states. Golly, I don't know this. Furiously judge, oh, I've done that. Furiously judging, juggling many tasks and thoughts at once in a super hyperactive way, which to me is very unhealthy indeed. Yes, we need to multitask sometimes. You know, mothers with triplets probably have to do that. But I think I'm, I'm totally with you, Peter, but it's the ground that has to be not in that space, not in a gamma state. So that's something that we, so that that's, um, you know, what, what, did, you know, what was I calling that? It's, it's like, it's powerful communication. It's being able to judge which state is appropriate. You know, I've got to give you the instructions and get off the phone. In a sense, it may have to be gamma. Pfft, day after day, no way, very unhealthy, thank you. Um, so I, I'd be happy to invite questions now, if you like. And I've got one from Federico. Go for it. Yeah, I prefer to, I mean, use my, my voice. Question. Uh, listening skills, I, I see, um, as I mentioned before, I, I'm learning coaching, a lot of uh, reading material related to listening and being attentive and, and being purposeful when you're listening and, yeah. and making sure that I, it resonates authentic uh um listening or purpose as well but the, but but there are things that are quite new to me and uh, and i would like to understand from you how do you see uh being worked out such as um when you mean about powerful or power communication and being in control of who you are mm -hmm. and uh and detaching maybe because when you are in control of who you are you are detaching from inner reactions inner conversations and and being reactive, um, so so that links also to inter intentional well-being. Um, and I would like to to know from you what are the tools? How do you work them out? Um, well, you'll I mean you'll get all the tools in the book next week if you want them. But okay, okay, that's fine. Yes, if but you... um, it, in terms of being in control of who you are. You're more available to the other person if, for example, if you're meeting somebody in, um, in in a space that you don't know, maybe it's a cafe or a meeting room or something, you're there first. You've put yourself in a comfortable position. You've made sure that there's somewhere comfortable for them. Um, you, you've relaxed, you've done your breathing ex exercise or whatever it is that you like to do. Um, and you in touch with being a little bit cheerful. Maybe you're remembering, you know, something funny that you saw on the way to work or whatever. You're, you're in a good space and you're open and ready for them. That's being in control. I don't mean that you're ready to manipulate and control them. And if it's with a whole group and you've got information to give them, new rotors, 
lists of things. You've got that printed, ready to give them. We can look through it together. We can check it so that that part of the meeting isn't a time waster. And then you've got time for saying, well, how are you? You know, um, somebody whose sister was ill. How's your sister doing? You know, you've got time to say hello and be with them because you're in control. That's kind of what I mean. You're, you're in control in the sense you're being a good hearted leader. Yeah. Um, and what was the, the second part to that intentional well-being? Well, part of it, um, I think a very big one and a be, very easy one to take on. And you could have a go at it before you get the book and see how you're doing. And that is we. Are we in our own lives always doing the things that light us up? Are there things that you'd really like to do, but you don't quite get round to it? Like I love, you know, I love going to the theatre. I haven't been for months. OK, go and actually go and see a play or whatever it is. What are the things that would light you up if you did them every day? It's getting out in, 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 in fresh air, actually, you know, walking the long way around because I go past the pond and I can see if there's any ducks. Whatever it is, it's actually making sure you're bringing little joys into your own life to um, as an antidote to getting emotionally discombobulated by difficult things that are going on in the business. You know, so you're looking after your own humanity. And in the book, there's a whole list of things that you might want to circle and, and do. Some of them things you'll do um, once in a while. Like one of mine is, I haven't done it yet, but I want to go in a hot air balloon. That's one on my list. But I'm not, that's not an everyday one. But I do like getting out in nature every day. That lights me up. That's a thing that works for me. Might just be sitting on the sofa with a child watching something. It might be walking the dog. I have no idea what it is. But consciously bringing those things into your life is an important part of intentional well being because you're doing the things that make you feel well. Hmm. Any more questions? I like having questions. Questions, please. Regarding the, I mean, the coloring starts, uh, stars, what you were showing the graph with the, I mean, with the progression in each of these nine dimensions, let's say, um, you put on any, on each one a specific goal to achieve because it's, it's, it's otherwise very generic. So what I'm trying to, to figure out is asking, for instance, for asking good questions, right? I mean, and you say, okay, what what is the level of progress I want to achieve in this particular dimension for you to say, okay, okay I'm here or there? Yeah, very good question. It's not a level. It's each time you achieve something. This is a practical thing. You're not judging. You're not judging whether you're whether you've moved up a level, but you might have just come off the phone to so and so, and you ask that good question. And so you give yourself a, a gold star for that. We like gold scars, stars. We had them at school. It's kind of slightly witty and light. Okay, that was, yeah, I did that well. I did that well. And you're just collecting successes. They can be really small successes. It, it, size doesn't matter in this because it's just building a muscle. So it's not a structured approach to reach somewhere. It's really to reinforce a behavior and to, it's, I mean, with positive reinforcement. Like the the, the the tab in the back uh, to to recognize yourself and continue doing things that that Oops. work in that direction. Yeah, but I mean, each chapter has got suggestions for the kind of thing you might do. So let's look at the questions chapter, um, since that's that's the one that just came up. And in the in the good questions chapter, here are some suggestions of things you might do. Um. Try asking someone to grade something from one to 10. Now that's that's something I talk about in the chapter, but we all know how to grade things from one to 10 because we've done it at school. So, you know, you, know um, you, you want it done by Friday. How sure are you that you're gonna get it done by Friday on a one to 10? How sure are you going, you're going to get it? So that's something, oh yeah, I asked that question, that worked. It came in on Friday, gold star for me. Yep. Or another one would be um, 
but it's been you know, that each each of these suggestions is based on a, you know a paragraph or two in the book but um when you're asking questions you can learn from how well they go down so if some if somebody goes all quiet ah oh, and then says something quite new and interesting that was a successful question that you just asked so you're learning to assess yourself you're not trying to le reach anybody else's concept of a level yeah and um so what I, well i think this is gerard i think i heard presence and truly being there for others which is something that i would look for in a leader but in a fast pace paced with focus on financial ROI, how do you make the slow leadership work? Time management. Um, because as you solve problems and waste less energy on things that aren't working, things become more clunky, that frees up a bit of time because you solved that problem and your next interaction with that person or whatever that was, will be different as a result of you having created a bit of harmony where, harmony where there was discord. The other one is to be relaxed in your manner so that you know what to say and you're not fluffing around. If you're relaxed in your manner and giving your own mind a chance to work at its best then it's going to be easier to quickly say one two three you're not fishing around for it in the back of your own mind um and as i said already earlier on if you're ready with whatever spreadsheets documents lists changes that ha that have to be discussed at the meeting that everybody's got it Ideally, they've even had it the day before. So the meeting is just about a bit of sprucing up and ironing rather than having the whole thing about explaining the spreadsheet. Um, and with people, who, I mean, it depends who you're working with. You might have people who are not, um, you, you may have people doing quite simple roles in, in the business as well. And they may need you to slow down with them so that they've got it. So in that sense, you may have to do it slowly for certain people because otherwise they're not going to get it. But once they've got it, they've got it and they carry on because there's a lot of repetition in their role. So you make it it work by sensitivity to what the situation is and being on it so that you're ready to be in charge of what needs to happen. And then you've got time to say, well, how is your sister doing? And, um, you know, how did the operation go? Or, um, you know, uh, I, I, you know, I've noticed you're on time more now. That's good. You know, have you managed to get a different bus? Or, you know, that you, people, you say things so that people know that you're aware of them as a person. And it doesn't take long necessarily. Um, and I mentioned it in the book when a friend worked, used to work in a bank and the lead, when the, the person who was in charge came round, he would always say everybody by name. Um, but when um, my friend spoke, um, said, saw him, he never used him by name. And this man said, why don't you ever say my name? And he got it. So now when he, in his business, he always says, says names people. And if your job is pushing the tea trolley around, that's nice. So it's working with people. There's so much you could say on that, but it's giving it's time management in a different way, not not by following a time system, but making sure you're making good use of your time and solving problems so that they don't come up again. So that people are happy, people are getting on with it, and they know what they're doing. Right, well, thank you, Judy. Thank you very much for covering all of that in such a clear and succinct way. Thank you. And thank you all, all of you for being here today and for your precious time. I appreciate it. Uh, today's recording will be uploaded onto the Alpha Group website within 48 hours, and you can access it or share it after that. Let me just...